let me mention one thing so I don't forget it in the end. So when, um, when you start working with the assignments, there are instructions and guides that you can follow. And you will get repositories in an organization on GitHub, private for you, uh, uh, repositories that you will hand in the assignments via and that you could use for your own exercises. However, we need to generate those repositories for you uh, on the organization. Uh, we cannot do that until you have done the following. And I know several of you have already. Uh, so if you go to the course web page, uh, I thought we had a link. What? Have I only written that in some getting started guide maybe? Uh, yeah. So this one. After you, if you do this getting started, you will have this number five, please register your GitHub ID on CoursePress uh, LNUS slash profile. And it's this page. The most important part here is that your username on GitHub is written here and that you save. It's also good for us to know if you're a campus or distance student or what program or whatever you are attending. If you're not attending a program, just says, say no, none. Uh, or if your program isn't uh, available, just say none. It's not important. It's just so that we know kind of who you are. But when you've done this, we will do, uh, we will run some code, say every hour or so, starting tomorrow, and we will generate those uh, repositories for you. So when you visit, and I think I have a link for that as well, I hope. Uh, I don't, oh well, some other, yeah, in some other guide. Uh, when you go to GitHub and the course code for this course, 1DV525, could you do it like this for your own distance? When you visit that page, you will have some kind of notification in the top saying that you have an invite for this organization. Please accept that one. When you've accepted that one, you will see your private repositories listed here. But that's usually not a problem. Uh, but just be aware that we're starting generating those tomorrow. So if you do this by this evening or early tomorrow, <coughs> you will be in the first batch. Just make sure that your GitHub ID is registered. OK, questions on that? part and that is the way you hand in all assignments we don't don't want any assignments sent to us via email or slack or anything all hand-ins should be done using github i got a question can we use uh, bitbucket instead no you can't or you can use bitbucket as well i mean there is nothing stopping you from pushing your code to both GitHub and Bitbucket if you like. That's totally up to you. But you need to push your code to this organization and your re repositories on this organization. That is the hand in the course. Okay, let's get down to business when it comes to CSS. Um, how do you know the program code for the register? Um, I guess you uh, that's a question from, from distance. Um, I guess you mean this one. Um, uh, I mean, if, if you're taking the software engineering program, the program var with technique, this is the PT 2000, and I don't know which year you are, but something like 15 maybe, uh, or the network security, Ma but, you are not attending a program, you just say none in this case. Hope that was the question anyways. CSS, uh, so I told you that I've been in the web business for quite a long time. I used to teach in HTML and CSS. CSS is 
if I might, maybe not my favorite kind of language. Um, I guess you love it if, if you're good at it. So I'm not particularly good at CSS. If you are going to get good at CSS, I think you should have some kind of artistic vein uh, and be good at design and choosing colors and composition of objects and you know the more graphical parts of web development or, or web design. I, I'm not the designer, I'm a developer and I mean it's not, nothing that says that the developer can't be good at design, of course you can, but I'm not. Uh, so I try to like cheat as much as possible, use frameworks that kind of makes it beautiful without me needing to touch it too much. Uh, and I haven't like, I'm, I'm not teaching CSS anymore, more than this like isolated uh, lecture. There are like courses in CSS if you like to attend those uh, at other departments. But this is, this lecture is more to get you up to speed with CSS and the must knows for a developer. Yes, yes, so you know that this is not like, oh, we will be web designers after this lecture. No, it's, it's more for developers, okay? Just a kind of prescribing, what's that? Yeah. Um, okay, uh, of course we'll go how, how, to, how to add styles to pages, the syntax, selector, specificity, yeah, whatever, we will cover those. So, okay, we have this. We are all aware of that this is like a standard HTML page, nothing fancy at all. We want to go from this to this. That's kind of the goal. Being able to add things that makes the page more interesting, even though the content on this one is the exactly same content as this one. For a developer, for a computer, this is more than enough. I mean, the content is here, it's logical, it's everything we need, especially if you're like writing a bot that should index this page. This is perfect. However, for humans, this is not as appealing as this one. And that's why we add styles. Um, good to know that there are three types of styles added to our pages. First of all, we have a standard built-in style. If we look at this page, I mean, it has some kind of style. There is something telling us that the background should be white, that the text should be black, that it should be this typeface or font face, that it should be a, a header should be this high, that links should be blue and underlined, and so on and so on. So that's built into the browser and that's the standard style in the browser. Um, they are quite, browsers are quite similar in their standard styles nowadays. Uh, there are something called reset CSS scripts that are sometimes used. So you, you add kind of a CSS that just makes it so that whatever browser you have, the starting position is the same. It might be that some uh, I mean the margins between lines are different in different browsers <coughs> and then using a, a, a reset script you will just erase that difference. Uh, if you're using like frameworks that you will be allowed to use in this course, those frameworks often do this so you don't have to think about it. Uh, but we will like start out without frameworks and if you want to in a later stage you can add uh, frameworks if you like. Uh, so that's the first one, the browser style. We can't do anything about that, that's how it is. If we have looked at a page, <coughs> you know the one I showed from, from the beginning of the 90s, it would have looked kind of like this but the background would have been grey because the standard style in web browsers back then was grey instead of white. But that's more or less the only difference. Uh, the user can add specific styles to the browser. If you are a disabled user, you have a hard time seeing colors or whatever, you want a bigger, better contrast, 
the user can add styles to the browser to uh, get a better experience. Can't do much about that either. That's beyond our control. That's the user adding those styles. However, what we can do is add styles to the page that the user will take in account when, when it mixes all together. And then we have three different types of styles that we will go through. We have the inline style sheets, embedded style sheets, and external style, style sheets. Um, I would say they go from bad to good. Uh, inline style sheets, you should avoid them if you can. There are some, um, sometimes you, 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 they are actually good to use. Embedded style sheets, that is styles that are written inside of the HTML document. External style sheets are separate files. And remember, I talked about the importance of separating things. And if we use external style sheets, we separate the HTML code from the CSS code. It's really good if you are several, if someone is working on the CSS at the same time as you are working on the HTML, you will have fewer conflicts when you try to merge this project together in the end. Uh, we have uh, uh, performance issues as well. I mean, okay, I could show you an example first. Okay. Yes, so we know what we're talking about. So inline styles, the bad ones are those. In this case, we add an attribute to a tag, a style attribute. The style attribute says, says okay, add this style to the tag. In this case, we do, I mean, it's something to do with the color. We are changing color, and we are aligning this text to be centered instead of uh, to the left. Why is that bad? Uh, first of all, you just specify it for this specific element, so not for all. First of all, we specify this for a specific element. We probably have a lot of uh, paragraphs on our page that need the same style. Okay, we need to copy and paste and copy and paste. That's not dry. That's the opposite of dry. Uh, so. That's one bad thing. Another bad thing is just to, yeah, and, and it's more or less the same thing, but it's hard to, to, to help me, underholla. Maintain. maintain, thank you. It's hard to maintain code like this. It's, I mean, if you're going to change all of those P's to another color, you need a lot of work. We have the problem with many people working on different files and, and syncing stuff. Um, this you should avoid at all times. Sometimes you, use, you do this just to test something. Okay, oh, I want to test if this, this works. Uh, it's always like that with t test code that it kind of sticks to the code sometimes, so it will be there forever. So if you, if you can, try to avoid this. There are some, some situations when we are kind of trying to move an object using JavaScript, then we need to add styles like this to the object dynamically, that's fine. But when you're writing CSS normally, try to avoid it, okay? A better way is to embed the style in the top of the page. We can do that inside of the head portion of the page, and we can use the style tag. So we say we have a style, the type is text slash CSS. Um, you need or you should add this one. In the beginning, they thought we will probably have many different ways of adding styles. However, it was CSS that came and it conquered. So we only have CSS right now. So, but we need to add that this is uh, CSS. And then you write your style code inside of the tag. What's wrong with that approach? You are not going to have only one, only one page, exactly. You will have multiple pages on your site. You will need to copy this on every single page. That's not dry. So what you will end up with is that different pages will look kind of different in the end because you forgot to sync all the changes. So that's typically not a good thing. Um, Another thing is caching. So 
when when the browser downloads a web page, it will request the web page from the server. It will download HTML. And then it will look for resources. OK, I found a, an image. It will request the image and download the image. It will request the JavaScript and download the JavaScript. In this case, the style is embedded in the HTML. So the HTML file will like be bigger and bigger the more styles you add. And every time the user requests this page, this style must be downloaded to the browser because it's a part of the HTML file. A better way of doing it is it's separating the CSS into a different file. Then you can link the same file into several HTML pages without needing to uh, update them all. And the most important part here is that this one will be cached. So when the browser downloads this, when you get to the start page of a website, it will download mystyle.css. And then the user will click the next, next page. The browser will load the next HTML. It will find that, oh, I need a mystyle.css. No need to, to download that file. It's cached in, in the browser. So the site will feel much faster. And it will load the user experience much faster. Uh, this is the preferred way to do it always. Like, make sure you link the CSS file separately um, so you have it in a separate file. We will start to discuss things like Webpack, where you could like pack stuff together. That's a whole different topic. We will touch upon that later. For now, just make sure that you have this separation HTML in an HTML file. CSS in a CSS file, and you will be fine. Of course, you can have 10 styles, if you like, and add them. Just add them and, and separate. So you have like text styles in one file, the, the layout in one file, colors in one file. That's fine. And just link them in. Here we have a kind of a problem with the old HTTP, the HTTP 1, because HTTP 1 has quite a lot of overhead when you do a request and response. So that the re request response cycle is quite slow. So lo loading a lot of files using HTTP 1 is not the recommended way of doing things. You should avoid a lot of requests to the server, basically. If you, however, if you're using HTTP 2, you have something called HTTP 2 streaming that makes it so you can actually have a connection open and it will stream all the files to the page, more or less, uh, or to the browser. Uh, that makes it so that it's not, it could even be better to have many files. So, but I mean, in, as I said in the beginning, don't focus on performance yet. Focus on what is best for you as a developer. What, what, do I want many CSS files? Because it's easier for me to structure my project, fine, have many CSS files. That's, that's fine. We can always fix the other things later on. <coughs> Which one has priority between styles? Yeah, I will go into that because they have different priorities. But we have something called specific specificity uh, that also comes into play. So I, I need to, uh, to, to wait with that question a little, little bit. Question on this part? Uh, as you see, you just say when you link the style sheet in rel style sheet, uh, you can use this link tag to link in other stuff, uh, but it's mostly used for style sheets. But you need to tell the browser that this is a style sheet. Uh, as you can see here, we have this is a relative path. Do you know the difference between absolute and relative paths? An absolute path is like HTTP colon slash slash vvv dot coursepress dot se la 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 la. That's the absolute part, path. You can send it to a friend. He or she could click it and it will work. A relative path is relative to this HTML page. So what this says is, OK, tells the browser there is a file called .css if you visit the same, I mean, if this page, HTML page, is called index.html, tell the browser that try to find mystyle.css instead of index.html. It's in the same folder on, on the web server, or same path on, on the web server. Uh, that is 
a good practice to write relative URLs because it's much easier when you try it in production and try it in, in, in uh, a developer server. <coughs> at least when we are doing things like we will in the beginning of this course. Uh, okay, so time to start to write CSS. Now, now we know how to link in the CSS file. So this is a complete, C uh, the code you will see now, that's the only thing you need to write inside the CSS file. You, you need nothing more, no style tag, no nothing. Just start to write CSS rules in that .css file. In the same way, that you would have between the style start and, and end tag in that example in the middle. Um, this is kind of the model. This is just two ways of, of writing it. The first one, uh, this property, that is what you want to change on the object. So if you want to change the color of a text, the property for that is color. That is like something you need to look up in the uh, specification. So, so color will change the color of the text. Background dash color, no, yeah, dash col color will change uh, the color of the background of the text. So this property you need to look up what you want to change. You write a colon and then the value you want to change the property to. So for instance red and the color will be red. Um, that's kind of the easy part, because you know what you want to do. Okay, I want this text to be red. I want it to have a certain size, I, well, whatever. The tricky part is to select what on the page you should change color on. Because you might not want to change all the texts. You might have one box of text you want to change. That is kind of the tricky part. And you do that with something we call selectors. So the first expression is a selector expression, where you select something on the page. Inside these brackets, you write how you want to do this change. This syntax is a little bit clumsy. Uh, you will notice that there are a lot of problems with this, this syntax. Um, but we will come to that later. This is what you need to know. Uh, you add a semicolon in the end as well, as you used to in, if you program Java. Uh, on every line, you can omit it on the last line, but if you do, you will probably just add another property and forget the semi semicolon. So always add a semicolon when you add properties like this. Uh, we have an example down below. <coughs> what this example says is, here is the selector. The selector is H1. That's the tag selector. It tells us that Every H1 element on the page should have those properties. So every H1 will be affected. It will have a certain color and a certain background color. So it says get all H1 elements and change the color to and the background color to. That's pretty much it. I mean, it's, it's, it's not a lot more to, to see in CSS and this. This this syntax you need to know. However, there is a lot of ways of writing those selectors on, and we should have a look at those now. Uh, so, the most typical one is the tag selector, sometimes named the type selector. Uh, we have the, uh, we saw an example, the H1. We have something called class selectors. Those are good when you, like, want to point out certain parts of the page or certain, certain affect certain areas of, of the page. We have the ID selector that is good for selecting one single object on the page. We have attribute selectors. You could do selections depending on how an object is behaving. So you could change all blocks that have a background color of red, for instance. So you can select things depending on their current properties or attributes. Um, and we have something called pseudo class selector. Some, some, some uh, um, elements on the page can have different states. Uh, if you think of a link, for instance, that link can be in 
in different states. Uh, for instance, it could be unvisited and visited. So with a Sevdo class selector, you can say that all visited links should have a certain color. It's often uh, purple uh, uh, as a standard. And every other link should have the blue color, for instance. OK, examples. The tag selectors. Easiest one, you select all H1s on the page. That, that's the easy part. You will not have any problem with this one, I tell you. This one is a little bit more tricky. It says, select all EM elements that are descendants of H1 elements, so are inside of another element. So you have an H1, and inside of the H1, there is a EM element, and that EM element will be selected. I think I have an example down here. Uh, yeah, so we have, this one is even more complicated, P, uh, blank space E and blank space strong. <coughs> this will say that take every strong element that is a descendant of an EM element that is a descendant of a P element. So we have like a chain of events. So this one, this strong here, is a descendant, I should mark with my pointer instead. This one is a descendant of this one, because it's inside of this one, the EM, which is inside of the P. So the EM is a descendant of the P. So this text here will be selected, because it will, this statement is true. However, this one is not true, so this text will not be selected, because this strong is not a descendant of an EM. So this, this will not be selected, okay? So it's pretty straightforward. Uh, they, don't, they do not need to be direct descendants of. There could be other elements in the chain, but they need to be descendants, not direct descendants, or children as we call them. A, sh a child is a direct descendant of its parent. Uh, it's descendants, not children. Okay. The class selector, probably one of those that you will use the most. Uh, class is an attribute that you have on every single HTML element. So every single HTML element you can add the class attribute to. And if you do, you can select those class attributes uh, using the, select, uh, the, the class attribute selector, which is a dot. So dot avatar will select all elements that have the class uh, attributes set to avatar. So that's perfect if you have like boxes of stuff on a page and you want to mark who's our developers and you want to give them a star in the profile, of course. Uh, then you could add to those persons, you could add class developer, and then you could just add a CSS rule saying that all developers should have stars. I want you to note this notation. In this attribute, you can separate by space. You can add more classes. So you can ha have an unlimited amount of classes added to one element. Um, I, I, in practice, you have like five, ten maximum, but you can have more if you like. The order of those doesn't matter when you use this selector. It will, it will fetch this one because it has the class avatar in that case. And also notice that this one will not care if it's a P or a div. It will just look at the class attribute. So all of those, in this case, all of those three are selected. However, you can co start to combine the selectors. In this case, we combine the tag selector of P with the class selector for the avatar class. This one says that take every element that has an avatar class and is a p element. 
this will disqualify the div because that is not the p element. OK. Are you awake? Because now is the tricky question. What happens if I add a space between the p and the dot avatar? You have all the clues to solve that puzzle. Uh, all the elements that are, that are descendants to the paragraph, that's got the class avatar. Yeah, exactly. So if we, if we separate those, we will get all class all elements that has the class avatar and are descendants of a p tag. So that's a totally different meaning than this one. So be prepared that the, the space in this case matters a lot. So combined selector, single selectors. Don't need to know what they're called, but you need to know what the class selector is. I can guarantee you that I will ask this question on the at uh, the oral hearing. I will ask, how do you select a class? Because, I mean, this is, this is CSS 1.0. You, you need to know that. Together with this one, the ID selectors, those are not as commonly used, but they are good to know. The ID selector is the hash sign. Uh, and or each and every element, just as with class, uh, each and every element has an ID attribute. You can add, always add the ID attribute to an element. In this case, we're adding the ID of content. This was, if you remember when I showed our HTML pages, this was kind of how developers did it before we had the header and the navigation. You have some div ID navigation, just to say that this is the navigation. Uh, you can do that. You can specify that this div is of special importance. I need to be able to, to fetch this div in certain cases. Uh, you can only have one, or those IDs must be uni un unique on the page. You can't have two elements with the ID content, only one. The ID must be unique. When you're experimenting with CSS, if you add several IDs content on the page, it will probably work. However, when you start writing JavaScript against this page and trying to dynamically uh, read those elements, it will not. Because the JavaScript API says that when you, if you're trying to fetch classes from a page, you will get an array back with all the classes. However, we, if you try to, to, to fetch an ID, you will only get one single object back, not an array of objects. So when we get to JavaScript part, it's really important that you only have one ID per page. Um, so this, but, but I mean, since they introduced all of those semantics tags, like header and nav and footer, the use of the ID has decreased. However, if you're like, say that you have a blog post, you have eight blog posts on the page, then you probably, or products, that's even better, products on a page that you are trying to sell whatever, you have products, you probably want a unique ID on every product. And then it, this one is good because then you could pinpoint a single product. Probably not in your CSS because that would be a hazard to, to, to maintain. I mean, okay, so every product, if you, if you, you know what I mean, right? Trying to add CSS rules for all of your products, that would not be a good thing. Then you would probably use classes instead and say that, okay, this project, this product is of this type, then we need to add this style. That, that's a better approach. But you will use IDs, but you will mainly use, I would say, class selector. But you should know those by heart, this one and this one. I guarantee that we will ask questions about them on the oral exam. I, I, just so you know, I won't say that about everything. So, so, so we will ask other questions as well, but I can guarantee that we will ask this one. Okay, I will just mention this so that you know that you have the, the, the possibility to do this. You could always select things 
based on their attributes. This is kind of a little bit newer than the older. I mean, IDs and classes, they have been there forever. This is a little bit of a more modern way of doing things. So we can use this bracket notation to find all uh, uh, elements that have the attribute disabled. So you can see if you have any disabled attributes or disabled um, elements on your page, or at least if they have the attribute disabled set to something. Uh, you can find all um, attributes that are of type button, for instance, by this. So you have the HTML, it's hard to see, but it says input type equals button. So it has an attribute with a value button, a va attribute type with a value button, and you can find that element by using the bracket notation as well. So you could actually, if you like, you could have like class equals avatar. That would work in the same way as using the dot notation. But you will not do that in practice. Uh, this is, if you know regular expressions, you are familiar with uh, like this uh, rooftop expression. How many know regular expressions? Oh, that's a hard word as well. Some of you, yeah. So you know that this, what's it called in English? Rooftop? No? Iceberg? OK. I can go with whatever. Any other suggestions? Power uh, to. Power to. The power, yeah, power to something, yeah. Uh, this, is, this means the beginning of something. So, so what this one says is, OK, take all a tags that we begins with HTTPS colon slash slash. You could find all elements that has secure links, for instance, and maybe add a a lock, uh, a key lock or something to that link, if you like. You could always use uh, the, the dollar sign, that's the opposite of the rooftop, uh, to find, for instance, all images that are of, the, has the source attribute with that ends with a dot P and G, and change them, if you like. You don't need to know those. We will not question you on those. You only need to know that you have the possibility to do those things. So if you find yourself in a situation that you want, where you want to do something with a certain file type, you should just remember that that is possible to do using CSS. And then you have to look it up. I mean, I don't remember those because I'm not, I'm not using them every day. So. But that one and that one you should know. We have something called relationship selectors as well. We have seen the first one with just adding a space is a descendant of. If you add this larger than between them, uh, then you specify that E must be a child of A. Uh, we have something called first child as well. You can specify that the element I'm trying to find must be a first child, and the first child is if you have uh, if you have a list, for instance, with eight list elements or eight links or whatever in the list, you can specify that you only want to find the first link, the first list in, in this list of eight. So that's the first child. I'm not sure if they add a last child. Maybe they have. They have in JavaScript anyway. Uh, B plus E, this says that E must be the next sibling of a B. And siblings are on the same level. So you can f look at it as a family tree. A child is a child of a parent. Two parents on the same level are siblings. So E must be a sibling of B. Uh, so I, I have used that one. I probably used that one like two times. That one I've used several times. This one I use all the time. So 
but I don't write a lot of CSS. If you write a lot of CSS, you probably use them all, but as a developer, just know that you can do that, those kind of things. Uh, we don't like to repeat ourselves. We want to, dry, to write dry code, code that is not like repeating itself over and over again. So often you, I mean, you have different, H1 is the biggest header, the, 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 the biggest header or the largest header, no? I'm trying to find a semantic word, uh, the most important header. The H2 is the second most important, H3 the third, and so on down to six. So this is the HTML tag H1, H2, and H3. You probably want them to look kind of similar. They, you want the same font face, you want the same maybe color. The only thing that you want to differ is the size maybe. Then it's unnecessary to just write H1 and then specify the font and then the H2 and specify the same font over and over again. Then you can group them with a comma. So this rule will apply to all of those selectors. And of course, those selectors could be how complicated as you like, as soon as you, uh, uh, just, you just need to separate them with commas. All all over the place. <coughs> mm -hmm. That's usually not a problem. Uh, Sevdo classes, I will just mention this. This is a common example. You know, when you're visiting a web page and hover a link with a mouse pointer, you will see that the link lights up or gets a different background or, or something else so that you know that you can click this link. Uh, that is done using something called Sevdo classes. As I said in the beginning, some objects or elements have different states. And a link could have any of those five states. It could be a link, which it is most of the time, but it could also be a visited link. And it could be a link that has focus, that the user has given the link focus. And that is often something you do with a keyboard so you tab over the page and are you if you are disabled not able to use the mouth ma <laughs> mouth <laughs> mouth uh, then you can uh, tab yourself using the tab key to a, a, a certain link and then that link will get focus hover is when the mouse pointer is over the link and active is when it's pressed when the user pressed down on the link you can actually change the style so that it feels like something is like happening when you're pressing the key. Then you just use this colon to specify the different states. However, the, the order in this one is important because the styles are applied from top to bottom and read from top to bottom and executed from top to bottom. So if, say you move the <coughs> visited link or th visited Sevdo class to the bottom um, or what was I thinking? Oh! I think you need two conflicts, right? Yeah, you, you will have, in, in, if, you, if you start messing with those and changing the order, you will get a conflict saying that hover will never work because visited will always, yeah, so, so if you place the visited after the hover, you will not get a hover effect because the visited state will overwrite hover. So the order matters in this case. So if, if you need to change, uh, which you do in the in the in the uh, uh, in, in, in the exercise, you need to have it in this order. Okay. Uh, yeah, we have this first child is actually a Sevdo class as well because the, the p tag is in a state that says it's the first child. So you call that a Sevdo class. Uh, okay, getting into specificit specificity. It's a hard word as well. So I got a question earlier. In, in, does the order matter and 
in which way are the rules applied and so on and specificity uh, matters a lot so what specificity is that that is that different selectors are have different importance and we can illustrate this by giving it some selectors the value of 100 some 10 and some a single one uh, if you are using the uh, ID selector, that is the most important one. It will get a specific specificity of 100. The least important one is using the tag selector. It will get the specificity of 1. That means in this case, if you write P hashtag first P tag, you're using an ID selector together with a tag selector that will get the specificity of 101. If you're using a class selector, it will get the specificity of 10. So this will get 11. This one, just the tag selector, gets 1. And this one also gets 1. But I added a plus because that's the last one. So if, if two... Uh, if two selectors are in conflict, get the same specificity, it's the last one that matters. In this case, the P tag will be blue, because that was, was all, or I should say it like this, every P tag on the page will be blue, but if a P tag has the class content, it will be green. But if it's also have or just have an ID of first P tag, it will always be yellow. Doesn't matter if it has the class content because this one will overrule this one, that one will overrule that one. And that is because of specificity. Even if I were to like mix the order of those, that would be the same as long as those two are in that order because they have the same specificity. There is, I, I will link that on the course homepage. How many of you have had uh, uh, Tobias Giedlund in the course? Yeah, he's quite a big Star Wars fan, right? Yeah. yeah. So, so uh, the best explanation of this one is actually a Star Wars example where uh, this is the Empire, Emperor, this is Darth Vader, and that is uh, Stormtroopers, and then you could like add them together. Um, that, that is, if, if, you, if you search for CSS specificit specificity, I think that is one of the top, top articles you will get. So I will link that one. Okay, specificity. Have that, I mean, you will get into trouble, you will try to alter something, change color, and nothing will happen and you will get frustrated. Just remember that there is something called specificity and that Hmm, that could have something to do with it, okay? Uh, in CSS, uh, properties are inherited sometimes, or, or the value, and the property and the value are inherited by, by its parent elements, and that's a good thing. Uh, in this case, if we add the color red to the p tag, this element inside of the p tag will uh, also get the same color. And that's often quite natural. Natural. I mean, if, you're, if you say that this, this paragraph of text should be red, even if you make something strong inside of that text, you probably want that text to be red as well. So that, I mean, not all properties are inherited, so sometimes you will find yourself in a situa situation where you thought something would in be inherited, but it isn't. Then you need to go to the specification and, and, and see, is this uh, uh, property inherited or not? Those cases are rare, though, so just, I mean, you, often you don't need to think about this too much. It's, it's quite natural. 
Uh, okay, where I say refer to the specification. What's the specification? Well, as I said before the break, Mozilla Developer Network is a really good resource for HTML, CSS, and as we will see, JavaScript as well. So I would argue that if you want a good doc documentation, go to the Mozilla Developer Network. Uh, you will find the CSS and CSS3 specification here. I will explain the difference soon. Um, I hope, I mean, this is from last year. Mozilla Developer, Mozilla Org. If you just Google it, you will come to this page. Oh, they have changed the design, of course. Uh, it's in Swedish as well right now, so probably I could change to English somewhere. Uh, and you have on the techniques, you have the CSS, and you have an introduction, a tutorial, and a reference. And you can always go to the reference. You will go over the style rules, the selectors, and then you have keywords. So if we want to change the uh, font style, we have the font style, uh, and we have an example how to do that, how you use this one, and it will say inherited yes. So in, in this case, fonts are inherited, and we actually thought that they were. However, if we look at, for instance, something that is common, padding. Where's padding? Padding, padding, padding. Uh, yep. No. Oh, padding, 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 padding. Okay, padding left, for instance. Uh, if we look at padding, padding is like if you, if we have this window, and you want to 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 add padding to the sides so that the text doesn't start right on the border. You want some padding before the text. Uh, it's not margins, because margins are outside of the border. Uh, padding in, is between the border and the text. But it's kind of a margin, but inside, instead of outside the box. So in the example with the window, it, it's, it, OK. So if we have the window, if we want the frosted part of the window to start like five centimeters, in, that would be padding. But if we want the frame for the window to be a little bit bigger than the window itself, that would be mar margin for the window or padding for the frame. <laughs> so, I mean, goes both, both ways. However, padding left, for instance, is not inherited. And that's probably a good thing, because if you have a text that should have a margin, you don't, do not want words inside of the text to have, or padding, to have the same padding, because that would look ridiculous. So often it's quite logical, but you could always go to the specification to have a look. OK? No, 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 yeah. So the layout changed, but the content is kind of the same. Uh, you will start to write CSS. You will all have your different code stats. How many hand up had? written CSS, quite a few, yeah. Every developer has their like own way of writing the CSS code, their own style to, to write the code. Those are some typical ones. This one, how many uses the upper one? No one? Everything on more or less one line. It was quite common before, maybe it's gone away a bit, but. I tend to not use this one, because I think it's quite hard to have everything on one line. I kind of use this one without the padding on, on uh, some of uh, uh, the selectors. In this case, padding is used to just show that this content P is like a subrule to that content, just to make it easier to read. That's OK. Some are, are anyone using this one? Oh, this is like. I, I thought this was more like a designer uh, because it's so, you know, you have the colons in a straight line and it's really neat to look at. It looks beautiful, but you probably need an editor that could handle that for you. Otherwise, you will go mad needing to change the colons all the time. But I mean, you can use this one if you like. It, it looks good, I, I must tell. I must say. Uh, 
do whatever you like, but be consistent, please. Do not use that one sometimes and that one in some files and that one in other files. Be consistent. Of course, if you're working in a team, you will probably have a code standard for that team. And hopefully, that code standard will tell you how to write your CSS as well. OK? There is a topic on Mozilla Developer as well if you want to read up on, on readable CSS. There are different ways of doing this. It doesn't matter. Blank spaces doesn't matter in this context. Um, you can write it however you like. Comments in CSS are simple. If you're used to multi-line comments in normal programming languages, you will recognize those. However, you do not have the single line comments. I do that all the time. I write comments like that, and damn it, uh, it doesn't work. So don't do that. Only multi-line multi, multi -line comments. Um, order matters as well. We have the specificity, but order matters as well. So I mean, you saw that the P, even we had two P, P selectors, but the last one linked was the one that were being executed in this case, because they had the same specificity. So it will matter in which order you link your CSS, because that is like in that order they will be executed when they are inter interpreted in the, in the browser. In this case, we have a re reset CSS just to null everything, make all padding, smart in, zero, have the same font size for everything. Then we add that first, and then we make our changes. Um, you can do however you like, but remember that order matters. So uh, now when we know how to select stuff, uh, we need to change properties. And I've divided the properties into four groups. The Properties that changes fonts and texts, like sizes, margins, font faces, and su such. Graphical properties, like colors, borders, shadows, different effects, backgrounds, etc. Layouts, like moving those boxes and making them lay in a different way, or, or yeah, how it should be set up. And animations. Uh, this one is new in the later versions of CSS to be able to do animations using CSS. You can, you can actually do a lot of stuff using just CSS in, in animating things on the page. Um, you always need to be a little bit careful about the support for browsers. Some browsers, as with HTML or APIs in the, in the browser, all browsers not supporting all. CSS attributes. You can use caniuse.com to, to, to have a look which browsers support what. Uh, it's, it's not a problem when it comes to basic stuff like sizes, margins, graphics. But it's when you go into transformations and animations and transitions, <coughs> then it becomes a little bit of a problem. Um, if you have, I mean, more or less every modern web page today has something called a f uh, um, a uh, help me out, you who know what I'm talking about. F flexible, adaptable. Uh, thank you responsive web layout. Uh, this has, the responsive web applications has been around for five years now, since the, uh, uh, the term was um, uh, created. And that is applications that responds to the, the size of the window of the browser. So on a desktop computer, it will look something like this. Uh, and as the window uh, gets smaller, we are now soon in like an, uh, 
uh, iPad or a, a, a smartphone on, on landscape mode, something will happen. And we have some kind of breaking point here. So, okay, this is the desktop version and this is the like tablet version. You see that the menu is up here instead. That worked not great. Um, if we look at the columns, we have four columns and boom, three columns instead. So clearly something is going on at a certain stage, like 800 pixels or something like that. Um, if, we, if we continue this one, we will see that another mode was triggered and yet another one in this case. So this is probably the mobile version of the page. Um, mobile users are really good at scrolling up and down, but hate scrolling horizontally. And you probably know that, right? Because you use a smartphone. You do not want a web page where you need to scroll horizontally. You will like this one. Um, so this is called responsive web pages. Uh, you do that by a technique called uh, media queries. This is kind of the, the thing that, that makes that work. When you link in your style sheet, you can add a media query. In this case, it says max width 800 pixels. It's a statement that says, okay, use a media query for, or load this link as long as the max width of the page is 800 pixels. So if it's uh, 800 or less, this style will be applied. And of course, you can add several links. So you can have several files that interact with each other and overlap each other. You could have, of course, one without a media query that are used for, for all of those things that are common. And then you could add rules for, okay, when we are in this area, this style should apply. If we are in this area, this style should apply. So you could stack those and get this kind of uh, behavior. If you like, or if you don't like to have a lot of links and link in a lot of style sheets, if you only want one style sheet, you could add uh, the media query using this at attribute inside of the CSS file, if you like. So you could have like, okay, at media, max with 600, then add this, and then you can add a new at media, and everything inside of that block will uh, apply for different rules. You have a lot of ways of doing this. Max width is just one way. You can use mean, mean width. You can even use uh, things like orientation. So you can know if the, the, the phone or the device is in landscape mode or in, what's it called, profile mode? Yeah, the normal mode. Yeah, yeah. portrait, thank you. Um, you can even see if this is a TV. So some devices will actually tell the browser or tell the rendering engine what kind of a device it is. So if we were to have, a, in this case, we are presenting on a projector, hopefully, Google Chrome that I use, notice that using APIs in the operating system and could, could say that, okay, so if I were to look at the web page that has the media projector, I will add a different style to that page, make the contrast better. Uh, or if you're looking at the TV, maybe everything should be big so that you can see it if you have a low resolution TV, I don't know. Uh, this is not that commonly used anymore. Uh, well, it's really commonly used if it says printer. That, that's one way of using this, saying, okay, if it's a printer, then we should remove some stuff. Maybe we do not want to print the, um, the navigation bar, only the content, remove ads and s things. Then you do that using a media query as well. Um, of course, you have some uh, read up to do if you you will probably use this I think we have I think we might have a yeah we have 
some requirements that you need to change, alter the size, be able to like have two versions and do some things depending on those changes. Then you need to use media queries. So in the first assignment, you will like write this kind of simple web page structure with CSS, yes, to get you up to speed with what you can do with CSS. Uh, you as developers, if you are going to, to work with CSS in the future, you will probably use all different kind of tools. And among those tools, you will find something called CSS frameworks. And CSS frameworks is just a way of letting, like, like a regular framework, something that helps you get structure on your code and helps you get the job done quicker. So you don't need to write everything from the bottom up all the time. Help you to structure your page, to make text look good, and so on and so on. There are many frameworks, Bootstrap, Semantic UI, Foundation, Materialize, uh, and so on. Uh, they work in similar ways. You add some uh, code to your page and uh, you read up on the documentation and you start using their predefined classes and IDs and whatever. Uh, you will get a lot of bonuses. You will get like the response, res responsiveness uh, from the start so that you, when you look at in a mobile, you will get this hamburger menu in the top instead of a classical menu and so on and so on. So there are many uh, advantages of using Bootstrap, for instance, or any other, any other uh, framework. However, I, I, I wrote, but be aware, you do not want to end up with yet another Bootstrap site. And that is because when Bootstrap came, and you, you looked at any given startup, you could see like, oh, yeah, that's Bootstrap, and that's Bootstrap, and that's Bootstrap, because they kind of look the same, all of them. The same font with the same buttons, Bah. So when you came to such a site, you got like, okay, this was boring. Uh, so you really need to personal personalize it if, 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 if you're doing that. However, for handing in assignments to us, please, if you like, use Bootstrap, for instance. It makes everything look a little bit more fun and more beautiful, at least, without you having to do a lot of work. Uh, I will say, do, do not use a framework for the first assignment. The first assignment you should do for your own with classic HTML and CSS. That's the like goal of that assignment. However, after the first assignment, you are free to do whatever you like. Uh, I could, especially in the last uh, assignment in the course, I could recommend using maybe a CSS framework, for instance. However, you are developers, as I've said many times. Uh, and you will, when you start working with CSS, you will get frustrated quite fast. Because you, okay, let's say, oh, I have this color, CF, the color CF35, uh, whatever, uh, 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 hex code for the color. Oh, and this color I will use 35 times in my CSS file. How would you do in, 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 in Java if you had like a value that you will reuse over and over again? I would save it in a constant or in a variable or whatever, depending on your language. However, you would not copy and paste this one in every place. You don't have variables or constants or anything like that in, in, in classic CSS. You need to do that. You need to copy and paste. You can't have functions can't inherit functions from each other. There are a lot of things in CSS that you as a developer will get frustrated about. However, newer versions of CSS is emerging, so some of those things will eventually come to CSS as well, but for a developer, CSS is quite fr frustrating. Then we have something called CSS preprocessors, and that is actually languages that you write in a more program-like language or a language similar to CSS, but where you have variables and functions and whatever. And then you have a pre-processor that interprets the code, 
compiles it to regular CSS for the browser. That's a called a CSS preprocessor. Um, I thought I had a list of preprocessors. Oh, okay, I have this one. Uh, so you will get a lot of benefits of using a CSS processor. Uh, you will have less CSS to maintain just because you don't need to repeat yourself all the time. You could write smarter code. Uh, you can make calculations inside of the code. You could use different ar arithmetic methods like adding stuff and calculating percentages and things like that, which is really handy. You will get a better organization. You could nest things together and separate them in files and then put them back together or whatever. You can use variables. There are a lot of things that are good with preprocessors. Um, there are a lot of processes out there. SAS is probably the most common one, together with LESS. Has someone used SAS or LESS? Or any other preprocessor? Yeah, some, yeah, some have. Um, I will not recommend one over the other, but I wrote SAS first. That's probably because in the Kalma courses, we tend to use SAS um, uh, in, in some of the assignments. But LESS is just as good. Uh, if you find that you have a lot of time left in the end of the course, when you're doing the JavaScript assignment, you could always think about like trying out SAS, for instance, or less. It's a good tool to know if you are going to work with web development. It's not a hard tool to learn. If you know CSS, that's just like adding a couple of rules and stuff. And you will get up to speed with this. However, you need a more complicated like build process because when you write your SAS code, you always need to convert that. You need to run it through a preprocessor and s s that generates your CSS code for you. And then we have something uh, called source mapping to be able to debug this in the browser and so on and so on. And when you start Working with those things, you will probably need to install a local web server, and then you will add upon this to a developer chain, and you will like start using Grunt or Gulp, and everything will like grow like this with tools. Uh, that is how it is on the client side. So that's maybe the warning that if you look into this one, you will go down the rabbit hole, and you will like find yourself in a completely different world. But that's a good thing. You will get up on the top eventually, but it's yeah a hazard to get out. Um, but yeah, we will talk more about this in the next part of the course. Of course, we will go down the rabbit hole, so uh, SAS will be the least of your problems there. Uh, yeah. Um, okay, so that's that for this part. Uh, what I want to show you is the developer tools in the browser because I have not included that in the lecture. Uh, when I started working with HTML and CSS, it was really hard to debug things in the browser because the browsers had no developer tools. The only thing you could do is trial and error. You changed the code and looked at the result. Okay, wasn't as expected. You went back, changed the code, tried it again and again, and just trial and error. However, uh, since, well, in the beginning of 2000, Firefox got a plugin, or Firefox came and added plugins to the browser. And one really popular plugin was something called Firebug that made you debug web pages back then. Uh, Firebug was so popular that every web developer used that plugin, more or less. And the browser manufacturers and Google came and Google had developers developing Chrome, of course, and they were developers and they liked Firebug. So they implemented more or less the same thing right into Chrome, which meant that Firefox did the same thing and Internet Explorer added, even Internet Explorer added or Microsoft added developer tools to Internet Explorer. And all the major browsers today have good developer tools built in. And that's a really good thing. Uh, you find them <coughs> by um, well, there are several ways, but uh, you could go to this one. Uh, it says tools for developers in English. Uh, or you could just inspect the code or whatever, and you will get up this view. There are shortcuts 
with keyboard as well, but that, oh well, I'm not recording on my machine, but sometimes when I utilize that shortcut, it cuts the uh, recording. Um, looks something like this. So when we are working with HTML and CSS, we have this view. What we see here is the source code of our document. And we could be like, but it doesn't look exactly the same as in my code. And that is because this is how the browser interpreted your code. I said that the browser will try to fix things that are not good. This is like the fixed version of your code. If you're doing a good job, it will be more or less the same. If you do a really lousy job, this will be, look completely different from what you are used to. Uh, and you could like, OK, we need to do something with the body. Uh, um, you could use this arrow to, to, to navigate yourself. So if I select this header, you will see the header selected here as well. Um, and of course, you could do things like edit the page inside of this editor, and you will see the result here. However, this will not be saved. So if I reload, reload the page, it will be gone. You can actually, today, you can hook up this editor to your environment and have the file saved from inside the browser. I, I actually haven't seen many people do that and develop inside of this, but who knows? Maybe in the future we will even more. I don't. I, 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 I just use it for like debugging and finding errors and, and trying out stuff. You might want to like see, we have the style here. This is the CSS. This is the interpreted styles that you have like added to your page. Uh, we might want to change something uh, in the body. Could like add a background color red oh this happened and you could like try stuff out with the css if you like so this is a quick way to just fix things or try out things you will also see that when you look here this one the font size is crossed over and that actually means that there are other rules that have higher specificity or uh, higher priority so this one is actually not used there is another rule that applies. So if your rule doesn't apply, you can go into the tool and, and try to look at that. You have something called computed as well. Computed is when every, all the styles are, are put together, what was the result? So this is the actual style of the, the page, um, like it is right now. So if I were to go with background color, you see that this is red, even though I have overridden black somewhere um, yeah that's one thing with this tool another thing is to use this one the, the device toolbar uh, so if you want to try your application on different let's do it like this instead uh, if you want to try your uh, application on different phones for instance you could try it out on an iPhone 6 plus iPad, Galaxy, Nexus, yada yada. You could add your own devices as well, just which resolution the screen has and, and, and so forth. Um, and now you, instead of a po mouse pointer, you get like a virtual finger. So you could try the application like this. This will not like totally uh, make uh, uh, testing on a device unnecessary because there are differences still, but it's a good way of starting out with, like if you want to try it on a phone, how would it look? Uh, this is a good tool to use uh, on, on the first assignment. You could tilt the phone, so what happens if you tilt it? Um, it was a while since I developed, since I've been on vacation, so there are probably a lot of news. Uh, we will get much deeper into the development tools when we are starting to code in JavaScript, because then those are n totally a lifesaver. Uh, I could show you the network um,
tab because this one is quite important as well. Uh, as I said, we have the server client model and a lot of resources are loaded from the server. Uh, this network tab is really, really good to have when it comes to like to, to see why an image isn't loading, for instance. Uh, you can see all the scripts and all the files being loaded on this page. The lnu.se, this is the H, uh, HTML page. So if we were to investigate this uh, request, we get a couple of headers, but then we will get a, uh, we will get a preview. So this is actually the code that was downloaded. And they have two blank rows before the doc type. You should not actually. So that's not a good thing. But, but you could, I mean, you could use this to see what's getting loaded. OK, we have a, a JavaScript, the jQuery script. Uh, it's loading images, for instance, this one. And if something goes wrong, you will see it in the network response. It will say, OK, so it wasn't found, or you, you do not have the rights to access this material or this resource, uh, everything will be shown here. And of course, you can use this tab for uh, like trying out, say, if, if we are on a bad connection, we can do things like throttling, saying, OK, we are on a slow 3G connection. And we load the page. And it will kind of simulate how the experience will be for the user if you are on a uh, slow connection, um, which is quite good because you can see, okay, what is rendering first? Should I change the order of something? And so on. That was like a really slow 3G connection, I think. A fast 3G connection is like this. Ah, uh, I don't buy it. Still a slow, or this image is really, really big because it loads quite slowly. OK? Um, there are a lot of things you can do with performance and monitor what things on the page is taking all the time and so on. But we will get back to this, because most of the tools are being used for JavaScript. However, this one, the elements, this one is really, really good to know. You could always have a look in the console as well. You could get some error messages printed out here if you have done something really stupid. The sources is the source code being downloaded. So you will see your HTML files. But we'll get back to that when we uh, experience the uh, JavaScript as well. OK. Or right click and choose Inspect. We'll get you the same result. Um, as you see, those lectures are crossed over. Lecture 1, Lecture 2, Lecture 3. Um, this two shouldn't have been. I know that now because I didn't change anything in them. But I've crossed over those. And as soon as they light up and are not crossed over, I have done all the changes necessary for this year. So you know that like all the resources are up to date, everything is good to go, uh, and so on. I will, after this lecture, or tomorrow actually, because I'll get home late, uh, I will add my recording on the resources here, if you want to watch that one. The last year's recording is there already. You can look at that one. If you want to look at the lecture again, I recommend looking at last year's because then you get different, you get the same message, but in different ways. If I, I just want to say, if something will happen, I mean, my kids could get sick uh, someday, I could get sick, uh, the trains, I mean, the, the winter is coming. Uh, <laughs> yeah. That, that reference was quite, uh, um, yeah, whatever. And <laughs> winter is coming uh, soon, at least. Uh, the trains will, or fall is coming, and there will be leaves on the track so the train can't go. Then the snow will come so the train can't go. 
And if we get a warm day, the, the tracks will bend so the train can't go. Uh, or a moose will die on the track and the train can't go. Because the trains are quite, they are not that uh, uh, easy to trust. Uh, so if I'm not able to make it here someday, have a l even, I mean, on Wednesdays, when you wake up, have a look in the Slack channel, OK? If there is a message, no, no lecture today, yada, yada, you know you can go back to sleep. Uh, OK, you go up, have breakfast, and before you leave for school, have a look in the chat uh, in Slack if something has happened. And if you're waiting outside the door and no one shows up, please look in Slack, because then you know, we'll know why. It could be like, I'm streaming the lecture from Kalma today because the trains are not going. Or please have a look at last year's recording. Uh, but bear in mind that this and this and this has changed. That's, that's the worst case. I hope I could stream from Kalmar at least. OK, thank you for attending, and uh, see you next week. <laughs>